Hi, SAGES members. Thank you so much for joining us in our virtual format today. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the indications and patient selection considerations for parasophageal hernias. I have nothing to disclose. To briefly review, uh, there are four types of hiatal hernias, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The vast majority of hernias are the simple type one sliding type of hernias, which make up over 90% of all hiatal hernias. The remainder are types two, three, and four, which only make up about five to 10% of the remainder of hernias. As we consider indications for surgery, there are two main issues that we wanna keep in mind, symptoms and acuity. The decision to operate takes both of these factors into consideration, but as our operative techniques have changed, improved over time, many surgeons and centers consider repair for even asymptomatic patients. The potential symptoms that patient can have are generally divided into both obstructive symptoms and non-obstructive symptoms as listed here. Obstructive symptoms include things like dysphagia, regurgitation, epigastric pain, early satiety, postprandial fullness, nausea, and emesis. The non-obstructive symptoms are things like GERD, erosive esophagitis, Cameron lesions or ulcers, anemia, and pulmonary symptoms. Most parasophageal hernias are chronic in nature and few present with acute symptoms. But for those who do present acutely, their symptoms are typically related to gastric volvulus, which can result in incarceration, strangulation, necrosis, perforation. The estimated risk for this event is low at approximately 1% per, per year. And people often cite Borchardt's triad, which is a trio of symptoms, including severe epigastric pain, retching with the inability to actually vomit, as well as the inability to pass a nasogastric tube into the stomach. Gastric volvulus comes in two different forms. The first is organoaxial, which is along the cardiopylorus longitudinal or long axis. And then the second is mesoenteric, which is along the perpendicular to cardiopylorus longitudinal or short axis. The management of gastric volvulus involves resuscitation and decompression. However, patients who present with necrosis certainly require more urgent operative intervention. For the non-emergent volvulus, we often consider patient risk factors to help us decide what the next steps would be. For some patients at sur higher surgical risk, a simpler reduction and gastropexy may be the best option. And sometimes we even consider endoscopic peg placement for patients who can have an elective repair, we often obtain several tests to further guide our operative plan and inform consent. Most often, patients arrive already with an esophagram similar to this one, which helps us evaluate both the size and the position of the hernia. Other tests include upper endoscopy to look for mucosal conditions such as Cameron lesions, esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, and even possibly neoplasms. Esophageal manometry is also recommended as most patients will require some sort of anti-reflux procedure in conjunction with their hernia repair. And that can help dictate what type of fundoplication to create. Other optional studies include both CT scan and pH studies. Other important considerations include patient factors, such as their life expectancy, as well as surgical risk and BMI. In particular, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about obesity 
with a BMI greater than 35. The literature does support surgical repair in most patients who are less than 65 years of age and in good health, regardless of their symptoms, given our good minimally invasive techniques. But we do need to talk about obesity since it's not only a risk factor for the development of hernias, but also for recurrence after repair. To improve our chances of a successful operation, we encourage patients to lose weight prior to surgery. Most surgeons use a BMI of 35 kilograms per meter squared as a cutoff since that is a point at which most people might consider a bariatric operation instead. Talking to patients about bariatric surgery instead of hernia repair can be tricky. Since we recognize that bariatric surgery has its own set of criteria and challenges and complications. Patients need to comprehend what bariatric surgery is and actually desire it. And the lifestyle changes are more intense than that of hernia repair. We must also consider preoperative requirements and insurance coverage, as well as the increased short-term and long-term complications overall. But as you can see, bariatric surgery is becoming more commonplace in the United States. This chart shows the more recent years from 2011 to 2016 of the incidence of bariatric surgery in our country rising. You can also see that there is a trend away from band as well as ruin y gastric bypass towards sleeve gastrectomy. That has really gained in popularity while we've seen gastric bypass drop. However, um, band is not indicated in patients with a large hernia and with its decrease in incidence, it is a procedure that's no longer performed commonly. Despite our trends in bariatric surgery, however, with sleeve becoming more popular, most surgeons feel that sleeve gastrectomy can lead to new GERD incidence of approximately 20 to 40 percent. And that's mostly related to decreased gastric compliance as you make the stomach smaller, as well as decreased LES pressure and increased gastric pressure gradient, which allows the migration of a narrow stomach through the hiatal hernia, through the hiatus of the diaphragm, despite the fact that we perform a cruel closure in many instances. With gastric bypass, on the other hand, there's actually a reduced incidence of GERD, and we are decreasing the amount of acid producing mucosa and preserving the angle of hiss. We also feel that there is a downward traction on the pouch created from the rue limb. And with the better weight loss with the gastric bypass, perhaps those things also contribute to the reduction in GERD. And may actually also prevent reherniation of the pouch back in above the diaphragm into the chest. So for those reasons, most surgeons would advocate more for a gastric bypass than sleeve gastrectomy in the setting of a parasophageal hernia. So in summary, the indications for surgery include consideration regarding a patient's symptoms and the acuity, as well as their own personal life expectancy and risk factors, including obesity, which can be a determinant of recurrence and considering bariatric options is also appropriate for those patients with a BMI greater than 35. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your attendance.